my guest is a friend, and she happens to be the winningest coach of women's basketball in, in history. I, I guess we need to say Division <laughs> I college so that people who don't follow basketball understand. I don't know if there is uh, that kind of a superlative for other divisions, but congratulations again, Tara. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, Tara has the most wins and the biggest span between national titles. I think you went from 1992 right. to this year, 2021. So that's a big uh, accomplishment. And essentially, she's uh, credited with launching the Women's National Basketball Association for her leadership and coaching, um, especially since the 96 win at the Olympics. Uh, the gold right. I had, a, I had a chance to coach the Olympic team that was the kind of a little bit of the trial balloon to see if women's basketball uh, was going to make it. And since then, the WNBA, they had an ABL also, another professional league, but the WNBA has, this is their 25th uh, anniversary and it's been doing really, really well. It's very exciting. So we have a little picture, uh, Tara, <laughs> that will take us back. I know um, you're excited about an anniversary coming up next year of Title IX. And here is the picture of you in the front row on the far right with your long hair. Uh, right. Take us a little bit back from those days, what it was like, the environment. That's the Chautauqua Boys and Girls Club staff mm -hmm. that uh, we all were part of. And here we are today. What's happened in the interim? You know, uh, first of all, I love being here. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, you know, thinking back to Boys and Girls Club so many years ago, I love going to club. And uh, Mel Llewellyn directed club. Um, you know, I've, I see people that, you know, are grouper, they're, they've been in their groups, you, you're friends for life. So the Boys and Girls Club was a great thing, and we were very active. Um, you know, obviously took swimming lessons, sailing, uh, but it was, it, it was really fun during the summer. But, um, you know, there, there still weren't competitive things for girls at that time. Uh, like they had red and blue baseball for boys. Uh, there were situations where only only boys could be sailing counselors, which didn't make any sense. Probably the best sailor was Candy Neville. Um, but things have changed a lot. You know, when I talk to young girls now that are playing basketball, uh, they, you know, they have basketball camp. They have teams. I never played on a team. I never went to basketball camp. And when I tell the young girls that, little eight-year-olds, they look at me like I have two heads. And you know, then they'll say, well, why was it like that? And I really don't even know how to explain it to them. So I'll say, can anyone else answer the question? And another little girl raises her hand and goes, sexism. So things have changed a lot, but they all, there's also a lot of room for growth for girls and women in sports. I think one of the indicators of what you've just said is the records that you and Candy and I think Wendy and other people, mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. set at club early on in those days in the 60s that some of them haven't been broken, right? Well, I'm very proud of my softball throw record and Kenny Neville has records and so does Wendy Owen. There were great athletes that were in my group at club. Um, and it's, uh, we're still obviously great friends, but we're also still very active, you know, whether it's skiing or playing tennis or, you know, biking. Um, and I think that club had a lot to do with that. And we're all good swimmers, you know, because of club. So, you know, and it's, uh, but things are so different now. I mean, a lot of kids don't get to come for the whole summer um, because school demands are such that, you know, if you want to play on a soccer team or you want to play on a basketball team, you're doing traveling sports. And I think there's some, there's some really good of it, but also probably some bad. And um, this anniversary that's coming up next year, what, is there anything formally planned for observing the passage of Title IX in 1972? Well, I hope there will be something at Chautauqua but uh, there definitely will be something in New York and throughout the country. Um, it's a, a major, you know, it was a major uh, federal law that has totally changed college experience for athletes, but it was not meant for athletics. It was meant for, uh, I think, uh, graduate school, for women to go to law school, women to go to a medical school, and to, um, you know, open up those opportunities for uh, girls and women. Um, one of the things I'm very active with, the uh, women's uh, sports, it's Women's Sports uh, Foundation, and there's a legacy fund in my name that helps promote women's uh, coaches. Because uh, before Title IX, there were actually 90% of the coaches were women of you know women's sports, and now it's down to like 42%. So you know there's been some 
unintended consequences of Title IX, which really hurt coaching. Um, thankfully, you know, I've, I you was mean, able to You mean trying get it. to balance it? Is that well? When, as soon as money came into athletics, then then it then it really a lot of male coaches came in too, and women lost a lot of opportunities to coach and. That's something that the Women's Sports Foundation and I think a lot of universities are trying to en encourage women to be coaches and it's a great job. I mean, it beats working for a living, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I just, I love it. You know, when I was a young girl growing up, my dad said to me, you know, I'd, I was out shooting and playing basketball and they, my parents didn't understand what is going on with Tara, you know, but he would say, come in and do your algebra homework. Basketball is never gonna take you anywhere. Well, I knew algebra wasn't taking me anywhere. And I've been all over the world, and I've sent my parents postcards, you know, from, I mean, Russia, China, Brazil. I've been everywhere and because of basketball. And those are things that are opened up now that weren't in the past. Did you tell me again what the fund that's in your name, uh, the Sports Foundation, which mm -hmm. you and I both know that Journey Gunderson, who was a Llewellyn, um, I mean, she's her grandmother was Winnie, and her right. her father grandfather was Mel. Uh, worked for the Women's Sports Foundation. Some of us are reminded of that when we see that she's mm -hmm. now heading up the Comedy Center. But but what what does your fund do there? Well, the Women's uh, Sports Foundation uh, has a legacy fund. It's the Tara Vanderveer Fellows. That basically, if there's someone that wants to go into coaching, uh, a woman is, is helping women get a start in coaching in all sports, not just basketball. So getting an internship, and these are women that maybe graduate from college, they're in debt, but they want to go into coaching, but how do you get a job when you don't have any experience in coaching? So that legacy fund helps with that. And um, the connections you have in the community in Chautauqua County, I know when you're back here every summer, you make yourself available to occasionally to sports-minded uh, coaches, uh, everything mm -hmm. that's here. And you mentioned to me recently that you think of this as a basketball area. I do. Um, you know, Coach Llewellyn was a great coach. Um, you know, I know uh, Dave Llewellyn played at Southwestern. Scott Llewellyn played at Maple Grove. When I grew up, Maple Grove had, had a great team. And, you know, I, Wendy Llewellyn was a great, uh, is a great friend of mine and, um, and a super athlete too, but, you know, she didn't have a, ch a chance to play basketball. Her brothers did. Um, and hopefully that is different now. Uh, Dave Turnbull is a friend who has just took the job at uh, JCC and Jamestown, so I'm very excited for him. And I have done uh, clinics uh, and, and want to come back and give back to this community, which is, they're very excited about basketball, so that's fun. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you're doing when you're here. I know you love mm -hmm. dogs. Mm -hmm. You just recently mm -hmm. lost your one of your labs. Are you yeah. thinking about another one? I, I, when I see you on the grounds walking around, I think if it's sort of a built-in buffer that you have a dog on a leash, you can sort of you have to move along. So you, you're, it's a little mm. bit of a filter from all the people who would like access. Well, you know, it's really fun to see people, and so many people will just you know will shout from their porch, you know, congratulations, and that never gets old. You know, and I'm and the swimming at the pool, so my day starts. You know, as you know, usually at six o'clock on the dock, I'm going water skiing, and I love to ski. Slalom skiing. So, yeah, that, I love. It's I not love water it. skiing. It's I a love it. Slalom and, skiing. You know, so I have I have a boat, and, and friends or family are always you know coming, and uh, my brother loves to ski. And then if it's nice in the afternoon, I get to sail. So I really take advantage of the lake. But in the meantime, I do walk my dogs. I try to take advantage. We had a great lecture today. Uh, going to the lectures. I'm going to go to the concert tonight. I go up to the pool. I love having the access to the pool and the workout center uh, and just seeing people. And, you know, sometimes after being at Chautauqua, I need a vacation because I'm exhausted. <laughs> but uh, it's such a great place to be. I love it. Well, you've introduced millions. Uh, no, that's an exaggeration. But you've introduced many, many people to Chautauqua, mm -hmm. especially from the West Coast, because you do live out in California. Right. And we don't have that many uh, Chautauquans who come and stay, I think, from the, the West Coast. You know, I, I wish I had been smart enough to have a, a guest book at, at our house because we have had people from really all over the country and all over the world come and stay. Um, but it's, uh, and they love Chautauqua, as I do. Um, and it's a really, a really fun place. And I did, uh, did some early basketball down at the, the Seaver High School gym. You know, and I, I'll, I'll tell you a story one time that I probably shouldn't tell, but I organized this game uh, in the off season and I forgot the gym would be locked. 
And we, I went down and my brother was there and all these people were coming to play and we were so excited. And I looked and they had a padlock on it. I'm like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? My brother pulled out a crowbar. There we go in the gym. So, you know, we replaced it, but it was, uh, I, I love being here and, and obviously playing basketball is, is really fun. There's so many quotes that uh, have gone down in writing of things that you do to inspire other people, not just bas basketball players. And um, I don't want to repeat them necessarily, but I, I know several years ago you mentioned to me you might have another book in you. You came mm -hmm. here and spoke uh, at the 1045 Monday morning, I believe it was the, the, the uh, most prestigious day of the week for a speaker and talked about it right after you uh, wrote your first book. Are you still thinking you have another book in you? You know, I, I'd love to write a, a children's book about basketball because as a young girl, I can think of going to the Chautauqua Library where you know, I, I read, actually the librarian called my dad and said, you know, I'm worried about Tara. She's read every book in the library about basketball, but they're always about boys. And so it'd be fun to write stories, you know, just um, kind of about teamwork and, you know, things that teams go through that I've lived through um, and put it in story form. So, you know, I know there's a lot that goes on, on the grounds that I could learn from, um, you know, about writing, but that would be what I'd write. Uh, I'm not really interested in writing about myself or things that I've necessarily done, but more for um, for young kids. In, in terms of your players, you always say how much you love your players and uh, how important it is conditioning. Uh, one of the things I've, uh, I guess I'd like to ask you is, um, I, I think of you as not drinking caffeine or, or mm -hmm. alcohol. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but when I've been around you, is this mm -hmm. just a, something that you impress upon your players or is it just a personal lifestyle choice for yourself? Um, I try, I, I mean, I never have liked, um, I've never really liked alcohol and it started with my sailing. Um, you know, uh, Dave and Tom Ingram, I sailed with down in Hilton Head, South Carolina, and we were down there and I was probably about, and I was always a driver because I never liked to drink but I was always a designated driver, but we were down there in South Carolina, it was so hot. We had a lot of water on the boat and we had a lot of soda on the boat and then they had some beer on the boat and we ran out of all the water, ran out of all the soda. So all they had left was beer and that, so I had to drink it and I got so sick that I've never liked it since. So maybe that was a good thing because that, you know, obviously um, an, an, another way to avoid uh, maybe unnecessary calories for me. The Olympics start on Friday. Mm -hmm. What are your, I, I think I almost heard a little uh, jab at, at uh, Connecticut saying that we need to be more red, white, and blue than mm -hmm. blue and white. I, I couldn't find it on the internet, but somebody mentioned that to me. I mean, what are your thoughts? The, I, I think the Americans, women were uh, having a little trouble with Australia for a while, but then they beat Nigeria or something. Where are we? Well, the, um, the U.S. Olympic team, uh, is, it was just a, a tremendous honor to coach our U.S. Olympic team. And, you know, to, uh, in 1996 in Atlanta, win the gold medal. And there's a, a great show, actually, it's on Peacock. It's called The 96 Effect. It's, it's about women's basketball, women's gymnastics, uh, women's uh, softball, and I think there, there's a fourth sport too that, you know, just how women really came into their own because of Title IX. And I think that um, this year's Olympic team, what um, I, I was upset by the fact that one of the greatest players in our country, Neko Ogumbake, who happened to play at Stanford, was uh, not uh, included on the team. And she had done everything up until she was a leading scorer, leading rebounder, just a, a great, great person. And um, I just uh, felt that there were, uh, you know, that, that she should be on the team. And so there was an article in the New York Times about that. I see. Uh, and it, and it did, uh, it did uh, mention the fact that, um, you know, how I felt about it. So Tara, as I recall, I, I met uh, a woman on your staff, she, she was fairly new, and I think she was the one who kind of was the first to go public uh, during the um, tournament about the disparities between mm -hmm. the locker room, or not the locker rooms necessarily, I guess the training rooms, the weight rooms. Um, and then other people came on board to talk about right. this and it certainly grabbed the uh, public's attention. Well, Nancy, thanks for bringing that up. Um, you know, when we think of 50 years since Title IX, y you know, we went to the, the bubble in San Antonio, the men's bubble was in, in Indianapolis and it was a tremendous amount of work to put on the basketball tournaments, obviously during COVID. 
Our team tested nine times a week. Uh, we, we wore masks. We never were closer. You know, we really followed protocol. We never missed a game because of our team. Other teams all canceled games. So when we got to the tournament, um, you know, we were used to being, we were away for 10 weeks on the road. Um, we really sacrificed to be at the tournament. And when we got to the tournament, um, there was, you know, social media has totally changed things. So our, our strength and conditioning coach, uh, Ali Kirshner, posted the fact that the women had a little, a little weight rack and the men had a huge weight room. That was just the tip of the iceberg. On top of that, the, the men had, they were posting their meals. These kids talked to each other. You know, they, they post on social media. The men had lobster. They had ribeye. Women had, I don't eat meat, but they had Salisbury steak and soggy vegetables. I mean, the, the meals were so disparate. Then it went all the way through, where there was branding on the floor. You know, men's was March Madness and branding on the floor with the NCAA tournament. And women's was, you were playing in a, a gym that was just down the street. You'd have no idea that it was the NCAA tournament. And I guess the thing that put me over the edge was the testing. Uh, we had antigen testing for the women versus PCR testing for the men. What, and, what's PCR? What was that? Uh, PCR is basically the gold standard in, in, in testing of, um, for COVID. Okay. And PCR is used, um, that's what basically our county went by PCR testing. Antigen testing wasn't even accepted. So, you know, we, we, we challenged the NCAA to, in fact, uh, be fair. And so the NCAA, uh, President Mark Emmert hired the Kaplan Law Firm and for any listeners now there that follow this, uh, if you have daughters, if you care about fairness, the NCAA needs to release the full Kaplan report to show, that, in fact, how it has been what I call steak for the boys and hot dogs for the girls. And that's what we, we grew up with that at, at whether it was club or whether it was in school, you know. Um, and it was always, you know, the best practice time for the boys. You know, when I went to college, they practiced from two to seven. We practiced after 7 to 9.30. We bought our own shoes. We, I mean, it's, but things have changed. And, and Stanford, um, you know, and the Pac-12, I think, uh, a lot of people have gone on record to say, the NCAA, this is wrong. And so hopefully they will, the Kaplan Report will come out and expose how wrong it was, and there'll be corrections. So to, we're hoping to, for to that. To take it to another level, I think on social media, um, I'm not going to have the numbers correct, but... I remember a side-by-side -side, uh, visual of Sue Bird and LeBron James. And the Sue Bird, they were saying, I think four national championships, 17 uh, seasons of play, uh, same thing, four championships, LeBron, mm. 17 seasons of play. And her salary was in the hundreds of thousands and his was in the 35 million. I mean, when you talk about how far we have to go, or and I'm sure it's not all a measurement of a financial, but mm. in, in in many well, ways it is. There might be a difference in professional athletics where, but college athletics accepts federal funding. Uh, college athletics is, I think, in a different league than professional. Um, although uh, the professional soccer players have, and professional tennis, uh, Billie Jean King basically said, you know, we want fair money. So the U.S., uh, you know, the U.S. Open for tennis, the same money goes for men and women. So there, there's, we have a lot of work to do and battles to fight. Um, but it's the same battle for coaching salaries and you know, assistant coaches, trainers, uh, you know, video coordinators. And the, the universities, uh, again, our, our tax money is supporting the universities through federal funding. And why should men be paid so much more than women? Uh, and that's, in, that's, in the, that's in the what beginning, we're, we're working on. I think when that debate came up, it was that that's where the fans were going. The fans mm -hmm. were go watching the men, and the fans weren't there for the women. But I think that's been turned on its head, right? I mean, well, I think that you know some of it with the tournament. Um, there, there's. I'm all for great men's basketball, and I know you, you know, are. And support. I, I watch it all the time, and right. I watch professional basketball. I watch it all, but um, a lot of it also is the, the sponsors. You know, a lot of it on television is sponsorship money and the NCAA, um, you know, taking sponsorship money and really, uh, you know, not promoting women's sports in the way that men's sports are promoted. Um, to me, is very short-sighted. Women's gymnastics uh, has grown in, uh, like, their viewership improved 500% this year. 
500% versus men's basketball was down 13%. Women's basketball is up. A lot of women's sports, women's softball, women's volleyball, uh, they just, there's just the, we need, I think, uh, improved uh, vision, improved leadership to show uh, people out there. And just an example of the Olympics. I believe the, I, I read today that the Olympic budget, uh, you know, for sponsorship is in the billions. There's no football. And men's and women's basketball is a very small part of that. The world wants to see sports, men and women, and a lot of the women's events are the key events. Women's gymnastics, women's swimming, track and field. So uh, people are interested and we, we've just, again, I think we need better vision and better leadership. Beyond gender, um, there was a lot of discussion about Black Lives Matter all over the country last year, mm -hmm. and athletics got involved. And uh, I think you and I both heard, uh, you in person and I in, on the television, uh, a speech by one of the winners of the ESPY Awards um, the other day, just saying how supportive this white young player was of all of the background support that she gets from her non-white uh, fellow players. I mean, you must have felt a strong vibe going on uh, during this national conversation. Well, you know, obviously, um, I call it the two viruses. You know, we had last spring and last summer, we had to deal with the COVID virus, which w it, it is just heartbreaking to see, you know, people's families, uh, you know, the deaths they've had, the uh, economic uh, uh, pain and hardship that they've suffered. Um, and also the uh, racism virus that, um, you know, look at George Floyd and not just that, Breonna Taylor. And I think credit the women's uh, basketball, the WNBA, uh, for using their platform to, uh, again, promote fairness, to promote, um, you know, that black lives do matter. That uh, on top of that, just looking at just how women, how uh, black men, black women are treated and to say, no, we're, we're, we're not going to just, you know, let this keep going on. And our, our players, you know, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have any fans at our games until the very end of the season, but um, our, our players got together and um, had a statement before each game. And I think that will continue. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's good to, for young people to use their platform to say, we're, we want to have positive change. You know, we want people to, we want this world to be a great place for everyone. And, and that's the statement. Did, did you have this question um, frequently as soon as you won the title? I mean, it was a lot of close uh, <laughs> yeah. points and, and scores uh, in March Madness um, when, when you guys were going for that championship this spring. But one of the first things that people were asking me who knew that you and I were acquainted uh, was well she'll probably go out on top she'll you know now yeah. she's uh, done this amazing thing after so many years is she going to retire and I'm sure you get asked that all the time and you must mm -hmm. have some kind of an answer <laughs> well you know this year was really special and we were we're the I think the only team to ever win a semifinal game by one point and the championship game by, by one point so um, I should have more gray hair and it was uh, it was a kind of a teach teeth clenching game but um, it was really exciting. Um, as much as, you know, I, I don't do it to be on top, but um, we have a great team coming back. I think we're going to be, I think our team is going to be better. Now, whether we can win it again, I don't know, but um, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm actually going back to California Wednesday to practice with our team Wednesday and Thursday. Um, and I'm very excited about our young team. And this year, because of COVID, our seniors could come back. So. We had two seniors that would graduate, but they, did, they wanted to come back. And I think that's great, uh, the fact that they wanted to be on the team again. So um, we have, um, I think, you know, it would, it would be, I, I couldn't, it'll be fun to get back in the gym and have, uh, have it feel normal again. You know, having people, not having to sit six feet away from everybody, uh, not having to wear a mask for every game. Um, that was, our players could really use that when they're, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> so, you know, it'll be fun to be back in the gym. So, and I'll retire when it's not fun. And I remember, I can't remember when it was that Stanford had to make cutbacks in a lot of its athletic programs. And it was tough for some of the departments that 
um, were cut and, and athletes who'd gotten there maybe on scholarship, I don't know, wouldn't, wouldn't well, have that chance. That, that went on last year, but uh, they've reinstated every sport. So we're wow! Big, yep, How so, did that happen? Some benefactor uh, came along, or I think I think it just um, I think it it just happened because the, it was called 36 strong. We have 36 varsity sports, and uh, we all wanted them. It's 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 very challenging to have that many sports at a small university. Um, you know, it's it's a private school with only 6,500 undergraduates. So one in six Stanford students is an athlete. Um, I will say though. Um, they're all really, really very bright athletes. Uh, to, to get in is the hardest thing about Stanford, I think. It's extremely demanding. Um, so we've had, you know, we've had players that I've really wanted, and uh, they, admissions said no, and we'd won national championships. I went over to admissions, and I'm like, well, why? And they said, Tara, what part of no don't you understand? So it's like, uh, you know, they're, they're really great students, too. So yeah. we're very excited that all sports are back. Great. Um, tomorrow morning, you're going to be a panelist with golfer Nancy Lopez for something that's a, important to me. I live here in Chautauqua County year-round, um, mm -hmm. sponsored by the, uh, I have to say it right, the Coalition of Chautauqua County Women and Girls, talking about women in sports. And 10 days ago, you were receiving what I uh, was surprised to, I just serendipitously was watching television, saw you. <laughs> Best coach of the year, not best women's coach, not mm -hmm. best men's coach, but Roy Williams uh, g getting on the stage and presenting you with that award. And an hour ago, you were throwing out the first <laughs> pitch at Sharp Field for a softball game between Chautauqua Institution All Stars and Jamestown Tarp mm -hmm. Skunks team. Uh, you exhibit polite behavior always, and you're a person who's not rude or angry about losing. Anybody who follows your games is very aware of that. Even I, when mm -hmm. you always wear gray, right? You pretty much it, when you go to your games, you're dressed in gray. Seems well, this like year, I just, this year I just uh, wore you know sweats. It was just I don't know, just no fans are looking yeah, at no, you. But, and um, you're kind and generous. And as I uh, think about it, I think you are the epitome of a good sport and a great friend. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Nancy.